Section 39 of A Visit to the Holy Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 20 of A Visit to the Holy Land, Egypt and Italy, Part 1, by Ida L. Pfeiffer. November 7th. I traveled by the mail carriage. By seven in the morning we were at Caserta, and an hour later at Capua, a pretty, bustling town on the banks of a river. Our road was most picturesque. We drove among vineyards and gardens through the midst of a lovely plain. On the right were mountains, increasing in number as we proceeded, and imparting a rich variety to the landscape. At noon we halted before a lovely inn. From this point the country increases in beauty at every step. The heights are strikingly fertile, and in the valley an excellent road winds amid pleasant gardens. The mountains frequently seem to approach as though about to form an impenetrable pass, while ruins crown the summits of the rocks, and give a romantic appearance to the whole. At about three o'clock we reached the little town of Cheromania, lying in the midst of vegetable gardens. Above this town the handsome convent of Monte Cassino stands on a rock, and in its neighborhood we noticed the ruins of an amphitheater. Today the weather was not in the least Italian, being, on the contrary, gloomy and rough, as we generally find it in Austria at the same time of the year. Yesterday it was so cold at Naples that Mount Vesuvius was covered with snow during several hours. The dress of the peasants in these regions is of a more national character than I had yet found it. The women wear short and scanty petticoats of blue or red cloth, tight-fitting bodices, and gaily striped aprons. Their headdress consists of a white handkerchief, with a second above it folded in a square form. The men look like robbers, with their long, dark blue or brown cloaks, in which they wrap themselves so closely that it is difficult to get a glimpse of their faces, and their steeple-crowned black hats they quite resemble the pictures of the bandits in the Abruzzi. They glide about in so spectral a manner, and I travelers with such a sinister look, that I almost became uncomfortable. From Geromania we still had a few miles to travel until we entered the Roman territory near Soprano. In Naples, and in fact throughout the whole of Italy, the passports are continually called for, a great annoyance to the traveler. In the course of today, my passport was visé five times, making once in every little town through which we had passed. It was our fortune at Soprano to lodge with the very cheating host. In the evening, when I inquired the price of a bedroom and breakfast, they told me a bed would cost two pauls and breakfast half a paul. But when I came to pay, the host asked three pauls for my bedroom and another for a cup of the worst coffee I have ever drunk and the whole company was subjected to the same extortion. We expostulated and complained, but were at length compelled to comply with the demand. November 8th. The landscape remains the same, but the appearance of the towns and villages is not nearly so neat and pretty as in the Neapolitan domain. The costume of the peasants is like that worn by the people whom we met yesterday, excepting that the women have a stiff stomacher, fastened with a red lace, instead of the spencer. The dress of the men consists of short knee breeches, brown stockings, heavy shoes, and a jacket of some dark color. Some wear, in addition to this, a red waistcoat, and a green sash round the waist. All wear the conical hat. In cold weather the dark bandit's cloak is also seen. As we approach Rome the country becomes more and more barren, the mountains recede, and the extended plains have a desert, uncultivated look. Towns and villages become so thinly scattered that it seems as though the whole region were depopulated. The road is rather narrow, and, as the country is in many places exceedingly marshy, a great portion of it has been paved. For many miles before we enter Rome we do not pass a single town or village. At length, some three hours before we reach the city, the dome of St. Peter's is seen looming in the distance. One church after another appears, and at length the whole city lies spread before us. Many ruins of aqueducts and buildings of every kind showed at every step what treasures of the past here awaited us. I was particularly pleased with the old town gate, Lateran, by which we entered. 
It was already quite dark when we reached the Dogana. I at once betook myself to my room and retired to rest. I remained a fortnight at Rome, and walked about the streets from morning till night. I visited St. Peter's almost every day, and went to the Vatican several times. All the squares in Rome, and there are a great many, are decorated with fountains, and still more frequently with obelisks. The finest is the Piazza del Popolo. To the right rises the terrace hill Piscino, rich in pillars, statues, fountains, and other ornaments, a favorite walk of the citizens. On this hill, which is arranged after the manner of a beautiful garden, we have a splendid view. The city of Rome here appears to much greater advantage than when we approach it from the direction of Naples. We can see the whole town at one glance, with the yellow Tiber flowing through the midst, and a vast plain all around. The background is closed by beautiful mountain ranges, with villas, little towns, and cottages on the declivities. But I missed one feature, to which I had become so accustomed, that the most beautiful view appeared incomplete without it, the sea. To make up for this drawback, we here encounter, wherever we walk, such a number of ruins, that we soon become forgetful of all around us, and live only in the past. The Piazza del Popolo forms the termination of the three principal streets in Rome. On the largest and finest of these, the Corso, many palaces are to be seen. The splendid post office, of white marble, rises on the Colonna Square. Two clocks are erected on this building, one with our dial, one with the Italian. At night both are illuminated, a very useful as well as an ornamental arrangement. The ancient column of Antoninus also stands in this square. The façade of the Dogana boasts some pillars from the temple of Antoninus Pius. The objects I have just enumerated struck me particularly as I wended my way to St. Peter's. I cannot describe how deeply I was impressed by the sight of this colossal structure. I need only state the fact that on the first day I entered the cathedral at nine in the morning, and did not emerge from its gates until three in the afternoon. I sat down before the pictures in mosaic, underneath the huge dome and the canopy, then I stood before the statues and monuments, and could only gaze in wonder at everything. The expense of building and decorating this church is said to have amounted to $45,852,000. It occupies the site of Nero's circus. Two arcades, with four rows of pillars and ninety-six statues, surround the square leading to the church. The façade of St. Peter's is decorated with Corinthian pillars, and on its parapet stand statues fifty-two feet in height. The entrance is so crowded with statues, carved work, and gilding, that several hours may be spent in examining its wonders. The traveler's attention is particularly attracted by the gigantic gates of bronze. I cannot adequately describe the splendor of the interior, nor have I seen anything with which I could compare it. The most beautiful mosaics, monuments, statues, carvings in bronze, gilded ornaments, in short, everything that art can produce, are here to be found in the highest perfection. Oil paintings alone are excluded. Everything here is in mosaic. Even the cupola displays mosaic work instead of the usual fresco paintings. Immense statues of white marble occupy the niches. Beneath the cupola, the finest portion of the building, stands the great altar, at which none but the Pope may read Mass. Over this altar extends a giant canopy of bronze, with spiral pillars richly decorated with arabesques. The weight of metal used in its construction was 186,392 pounds, and the cost of the gold for gilding was $40,000. The entire canopy is worth above $150,000. The cupola was executed by Michelangelo. It rests on four massive pillars, each of them furnished with a balcony. In the interior of these pillars, chapels are constructed, where the chief relics are kept, and only displayed to the people from the balcony at particular times. I was in the church at the time when the handkerchief, which wiped the drops of agony from our Lord's brow, and a piece of the true cross, were shown. The pulpit stands in a very elevated position, and was executed in bronze by Bernini. 219,161 pounds of metal and $172,000 were 
were spent upon its construction. In the interior is concealed the wooden pulpit from which St. Peter preached, and immediately beside this we find a pillar of white marble, said to have belonged to Solomon's temple at Jerusalem. The lions on the monument of Clement the Thirteenth by Canova, are considered the finest that were ever sculptured. I was fortunate enough to penetrate into the catacombs of St. Peter's, a favor which women rarely obtain, and which I only owed to my having been a pilgrim at Jerusalem. These catacombs consist of handsome passages and pillars of masonry, which do not, however, exceed eight or nine feet in height. A number of sarcophagi, containing the remains of emperors and popes, are here deposited. The roof of St. Peter's covers an immense area, and is divided into a number of cupolas, chambers, and buildings. A fountain of running water is even found here. From this roof we have a splendid view as far as the sea and the Apennines. We can descry the entire Vatican, which adjoins the church, as well as the Pope's gardens. I ascended to the ball in the great cupola, where there is nothing to be seen, as there is not the slightest opening, much less a window, left in it. Nothing is to be gained by mounting into this dark, narrow receptacle but the glory of being able to say, I have been there. It is far more interesting to look down from the windows and galleries of the great cupola into the body of the church itself, for then we can estimate the grandeur of the colossal building, and the people who walk about beneath appear like dwarves. Two noble fountains deck the square in front of St. Peter's, and in the midst towers a magnificent obelisk from Heliopolis, said to weigh 992,789 pounds. Near this obelisk are two slabs, by standing on either of which we can see all the rows of columns melted, as it were, into one. My journey to Jerusalem also obtained for me an audience of the Pope. His Holiness received me in a great hall adjoining the Sistine Chapel. Considering his great age of seventy-eight years, the Pope still has a noble presence and most amiable manners. He asked me some questions, gave me his blessing, and permitted me, at parting, to kiss the embroidered slipper. My second walk was to the Vatican. Here I saw the immense halls of Raphael, the staircases of Bramante and Bernini, and the Sistine Chapel, containing Michelangelo's masterpieces, the world-renowned frescoes. The immense wall behind the high altar represents the Last Judgment, while the ceilings are covered with prophets and sibyls. The picture gallery contains many works of the great masters, as does also the gallery of vases and candelabra. The Biga chamber, the Biga is an antique carriage of white marble, drawn by two horses. In the gallery of statues, the figure representing Nero as Apollo playing on the lyre is the finest. In the gallery of busts, those of Menelaus and Jupiter preeminently attract attention. The name of the Laocoon cabinets indicates the masterpiece it contains, as also the cabinet of the Apollo Belvedere. The latter statue was found in Nero's baths at Porto d'Anzio. The celebrated torso of the Belvedere, a fragment of Greek art, which Michael partly used as his model, is placed in the square vestibule. Never was flesh so pliably counterfeited in stone as in this masterpiece. A long gallery contains a series of tapestries, the designs for which were drawn by Raphael. The Vatican contains ten thousand rooms, twenty large halls, eight large and about two hundred small staircases. The Curinal Palace, the summer residence of the Pope, lies on the hill of the same name, Monte Cavallo, which is quite covered with villas and beautiful houses, on account of the salubrity of the air. I visited most of the private palaces and picture galleries. The principal are the Colonna Palace, on the Quirinal Hill, the Barberini Palace, where we find a portrait of Raphael's mistress, Fornarina, painted by himself, and an original picture of Beatrice Senzi, by Guido Steri. The finest of all the Roman palaces is that of the Borghese. From its form, which resembles a piano, this building has obtained the name of Il Sembalo de Borghese. The gallery contains sixteen hundred paintings, most of them masterpieces by celebrated artists. 
The Farnese Palace is remarkable for its architecture, and the Stopani for its architect, Raphael. Besides these, there are many other palaces. I saw but few villas, for the weather was generally bad, and it rained almost every day. I visited the Villa Borghese on a Sunday, when there is a great bustle here, for a stream of people on foot, on horseback, and in carriages, sets in towards its beautiful park, situate just beyond the Piazza del Popolo, on the same way that the crowds flock to our beloved Prater on a fine day in spring. I also saw the Villa Medicis and the Villa Pamphili. The latter boasts a very extensive park. I took care to visit most of the churches. My plan was to go out early in the morning and to inspect several churches until about eleven o'clock, when it was time to repair to the galleries. When I went to the principal churches, for instance, those of St. John of Lateran, St. Paul, St. Maria Maggiore, St. Loris, and St. Sebastian, I was always accompanied by a guide specially appointed to conduct strangers to the churches. I could fill volumes with the description of the riches and magnificence they display. The church of St. John of Lateran possesses the wooden altar at which St. Peter is said to have read Mass, the wooden table at which Jesus sat to eat the Last Supper, and the heads of the disciples Peter and Paul. Near this church, in a building specially constructed for it, is the Scala Santa, Holy Staircase, which was brought from Jerusalem and deposited here. This is a flight of twenty-eight steps of white marble, covered with boards, which no one is allowed to ascend or descend in the regular way, every man being required to shuffle up and down on his knees. Near this holy stair a common one is built, which it is lawful to ascend in the regular way. The Basilica of St. Paul lies beyond the gate of the same name, in a very insalubrious neighborhood. It is only just rebuilt after having been destroyed by fire. The Basilica Maria Maggiore, in which is deposited the Holy Gate, has the highest belfry in Rome, and above its portico we see a beautiful chamber where the new Pope stands to dispense the first blessing among the people. In the chapel of the crucifix, five pieces of the wood of the Savior's manger are preserved in a silver urn. St. Lorenzo, a mile from the town, is a very plain-looking edifice. Here we find the Campo Santo, or cemetery. The graves are covered with large blocks of stone. St. Bessoriana is also called the Church of the Holy Cross of Jerusalem, from the fact that a piece of the cross is preserved here. Besides the letters I-N-R-I, some thorns, and a pale. St. Sebastian in the suburbs, one of the most ancient Roman churches, is built over the great catacombs, in which 174,000 Christians were buried. The catacombs are some stories deep, and extend over a large area. All the above-named basilicas are so empty, and stand on such lonely spots, that I was almost afraid to visit them alone. The handsome church of Santa Maria in Travastare contrasts strangely with the quarter of the town in which it lies. This part of Rome is inhabited by people calling themselves descendants of the ancient Trojans. Santa Maria ad Martires, or the Rotunda, once the pantheon of Agrippa, is in better preservation than any other monument of ancient Rome. The interior is almost in its pristine condition. It contains no less than fifteen altars. In this church Raphael is buried. The Rotunda has no windows, but receives air and light through a circular opening in the cupola. The best view of ancient Rome is to be obtained from the tower of the Senate House. From this place we see stretched out beneath us Mount Palatine, the site of ancient Rome, the capital in the midst of the city, the Quirinal Hill, Monte Cavallo, with the summer residence of the Pope, the Esquiline Mount, the loftiest of the hills, Mount Aventine, the Vatican, and lastly Monte Testaccio, consisting entirely of broken pottery which the Romans throw down here. I also paid a visit to the Ponte Publicus, the most ancient bridge in Rome, in the neighborhood of which Horatius Cloclus achieved his heroic action, and the Tullian prison beneath the church of St. Joseph of Falniani, where Jugurtha was starved to death. The staircase leading up to the building is called the Steps of Size. The capital has unfortunately fallen into decay. We can barely distinguish a few remains of temples and other buildings. 
Of the graves of the Scipios I could discover also little more than the site. The subterranean passages are nearly all destroyed. The Mars field is partly covered with buildings, and partly used as a promenade. Cestius's grave is uncommonly well preserved, and a pyramid of large square stones surrounds the sarcophagus. The aqueducts are built of large blocks of stone fastened together without mortar. They are now no longer used, as they have partly fallen into decay, and some of the springs have dried up. The hot baths of Titus are well worth a visit, though in a ruined condition. Here the celebrated Laconian group was found. Near these baths is the great reservoir called the Seven Halls of Titus. One of the greatest and best preserved buildings of ancient Rome is the amphitheater of Flavius, or the Colosseum, once the scene of the combats with wild beasts. It was capable of holding 87,000 spectators. Four stories yet remain. This building is seen to the greatest advantage by torchlight. I was fortunate enough to find an opportunity of joining a large party, and we were thus enabled to divide the expense. The triumphal arch of Titus, of white marble, covered with glorious sculptures, the arches of Septimus Severus, that of Janus, and several other antique monuments, are to be seen near the Colosseum. The beautiful bridge of St. Angelo, constructed entirely of square blocks of stone, leads across the Tiber to the castle of the same name, the tomb of Hadrian. The emperor caused this large round building to be erected for his future mausoleum. It is built of immense stone blocks and now serves as a fortress and a state prison. The temple of Marcus Aurelius is converted into the Dogana. That of Minerva Medicia lies in the midst of a vineyard and is built in the form of a rotunda. The upper part has sunk in. There are twelve obelisks in the different public squares of Rome, all brought from Egypt. I still have to mention the 108 fountains, from which fresh water continually spouts into the air. Foremost among them in size and beauty is the Fontana Trevi. I was prevented by the bad weather from making trips to any distance, but one afternoon I drove to Tivoli. The road leading thither is called the Tiburtinium. After traveling for about six miles, we became conscious of a dreadfully offensive sulfurous smell and soon found that it proceeds from a little river running through the Solfatara. A ride of eighteen Italian miles brought us to the town of Tivoli, lying amidst olive woods on the declivity of the Apennines, and numbering about seven thousand inhabitants. Towards evening I took a short walk in the town, beneath the protection of an umbrella, and was not much pleased. Next morning I left the house early, and proceeded to the temple of Sibylla, built on a rock opposite to the waterfall. Afterwards I went to view the grotto of Neptune, and that through which the Arno flows, rushing out of the cavern to fall headlong over a ledge of lofty rocks, and form the cascade of Tivoli. The best view of this fall is obtained from the bridge. Besides many pretty minor cascades, I saw a number of ruins. The most remarkable among these was the villa of Mycenaeus. End of section 39